Welcome to Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman, the only show where a six-time New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned Bible scholar uncovers the many fascinating, little-known facts about the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the rise of Christianity. I'm your host, Megan Lewis. Let's begin. Hello, Bart. How are you doing today? Oh, so far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> ready to talk about apocalypticism? I'm, I'm always ready to talk about it. It's one of my favorite topics. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and, how, and how, how are you doing? Okay. Yep, busy. Um, I've got some projects I'm trying to wrap up before Christmas hits us, and it's all insane again. Um, yeah. Okay. But, what projects? Um, my husband and I have written, so he we wrote a, an introduction to Sumerian grammar for people who, I know, I know. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, as one does, uh, for people who are interested but aren't ready to tackle a reference grammar. Because you've got, uh, you can get on Amazon, like, teach yourself uh, Koine Greek, teach yourself Biblical Hebrew, teach yourself Akkadian, but there's nothing in the same line for Sumerian. So if you want to learn Sumerian, you're kind of reliant on Wikipedia and academic reference grammars, which are really intimidating. So we wrote a couple of years ago now an introduction for absolute complete beginners. And he's just finished up the main body of book two, which is more of an intermediate um, going into a little bit of the more, more of the nuances, really. So I'm going through that, editing it and putting all the ex exercises together because I want to try and get it out before Christmas, but um, I don't know if we're going uh, to make so, that happen. So, I'm uh, so for, um, for, for those of us who are lesser mortals, I assume Sumerian is the, le uh, the language of ancient Sumer. <laughs> it is, <laughs> and, uh, yes. And is it, do you have to learn cuneiform to write this? I mean, do they, yes. is there an alphabet? <laughs> <laughs> no alphabet, unfortunately, uh, but it's, it's, yes, written in cuneiform and it's really interesting, actually, because Sumerian persists long after it stops being spoken, kind of like Latin did in the Western world. So it gets used as a literary language and a religious language and a language of liturgy a long time after it stops being a commonly spoken language. Um, and actually, Josh's dissertation, his PhD dissertation, was looking at... at um, phonetically written Sumerian. So it's Sumerian not written with what we would call typical cuneiform spelling. It's written phonetically. And he's arguing, he's arguing that it was these texts were being used or being written for people who did not know Sumerian, but so they could still pronounce it uh, in religious rituals. So they don't need to understand what they're saying. They just need to be able to read it and pronounce it because the gods then will understand the actual word words interesting yes yes oh no that's really can i just add just another quick thing is it is it related to other languages we know is it no. semitic is it like uh, no. you know like uh english <laughs> what, what? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's language isolate so it, it's in its own language family there's nothing comparable nothing related you do occasionally get people trying to argue that oh it's related to finnish or it's related to uh mandarin or oh. something else but no actual linguists have ever made a connection between Sumerian and anything else. It's definitely not Semitic. Okay. Well, we're going to, uh, I'm going to want to interview about you about this sometime. <laughs> okay. Yeah, very good. Okay. Um, and I didn't ask you, how's your week been? Oh, my week. Yeah. My week, my week has been, my week has been fine. I, I'm, um, uh, so I've started a, a new book project, <laughs> and so uh, and so I've started reading, and it's I'll, we'll talk more about it later. But the rough idea is about how Christianity changed the understanding of ethics in the ancient Ooh. world, and so I'm reading a lot of uh, Greek and Roman ethics right now, and so fantastic, fantastic stuff. Uh, and so I'm at preliminary stage. I'm not I'm not going to write the book for another year or so. <laughs> so I'm just just reading around, thinking about it. Are you still reading Greek every morning? 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, uh, I've been, you know, I've been working on Homeric, my Homeric Greek, but I've decided that um, I've been doing, I've been reading Homer for, you know, a long time now. I'm thinking that I'm going to start reading some of the dramas, and so I'm, I'm debating whether to read Sophocles, uh, Oedipus Rex, or to read uh, the Medea. <laughs> oh, I love the Medea. I love them both, and so uh, anyway, uh, yeah. So it's a debate, but I'm, yeah, no, Greek every morning. That's that's, you know, not Sumerian, but Greek. <laughs> I so I don't I don't know Greek, but I did. We read a lot of Greek dramas in my high school classics class, and I need to go back and reread them because it. Uh, I have very fond memories of them. They're fantastic yeah. things. Well, it's like Shakespeare, you know where. You, you don't want to just read the play once and say, OK, I got it, you know, because you don't you don't yeah. got it. And so uh, these Greek, the Greek tragedies are so powerful and deeply mm -hmm. meaningful, even today, uh, very much so. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's a it's a great, a great thing to be doing. That. I suspect they'll hit pretty differently, given that I'm in my 30s compared to late oh, yeah. teens. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. No, that's right. Great literature does that, right? The older you get, mm -hmm. the, the things change and you have more mm -hmm. life experiences and you start seeing things you didn't even think about before. Well, we should probably get on with our apocalypticism discussion. Okay. What is, for those who are uninitiated, what is apocalypticism? Uh, yeah, I'd say most people are uninitiated. <laughs> this is not the kind of thing you talk about at the cocktail party, or if you do, <laughs> you're going to the wrong cocktail party. Honestly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I actually go to the right ones <laughs> because <laughs> I go to the wrong ones. I got nothing to talk about. Yeah, somebody <laughs> asks you, you know, you're at a regular cocktail. What do you do? Yeah, I teach New Testament. Huh? That's interesting. <laughs> then walk off. And I'm, I'm always, I'm always stuck when people ask me what I do. Our pediatrician asked me this morning because I, I mentioned that the babies are now in daycare, so I can like start working properly again. She was, and she was saying, "Oh, so what do you do?" I'm like, "Ah, uh, how much detail do you realistically want? Because I can go with, I'm an historian, or I can like introduce you to the whole of Mesopotamia." Uh, <laughs> I'm writing a Sumerian grammar. What are you doing today? <laughs> <laughs> right. <sighs> so, uh, right. What was the question? Oh, yeah. <laughs> An initiative, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So apocalypticism. So apocalypticism, um, as we're going to see, is really a very, very important topic for understanding the Bible, especially the New Testament, but not only the New Testament. It's a, um, it, the word apocalypticism comes from, uh, people probably guess comes from apocalypse, uh, apocalypsis in Greek. It, the word apocalypse in Greek, apocalypsis, means uh, a revealing or an unveiling or a disclosure. Um, this, this term gets applied to a religious point of view that developed in ancient Judaism, a couple of, starting about a couple hundred years before Jesus, that uh, believed that the world was controlled by forces of evil uh, and that God was soon going to intervene to get rid of all the evil, destroy all the evil, and everybody supported the evil to bring in a good utopian kingdom here on earth, and that this was all going to happen very soon. And so apocalypticism is called that because these some of these Jewish prophets, these seers, had been shown by God, been revealed what this future, this new future was going to be, and that it was coming very soon. And so this became a movement within Judaism, and it ends up affecting Jesus very seriously, and Paul seriously, and the entire New Testament seriously. And it, I think still affecting us today, because you still have these doomsday cults and people saying, oh, well, the world's going to end next Wednesday. I've sat down and, and calculated it, um, which I think is very interesting, because you, you see in in the book of Revelation and probably other apocalyptic texts, the importance of numbers. And people use like special religious significant mystical numbers. But then you have people in in modern religious circles doing almost exactly the same thing. Yeah. Counting yeah, the number of times X is mentioned and saying, oh, well, it's 12. So we've got 12 months or. or... Yeah. Yeah. No, that's right. And and you can count the numbers because the, in the, these apocalyptic texts, starting with the book of Daniel, but also the Revelation, lots of other texts, there are. Uh, numbers that are given that so and so is going to take you know it's going it's going to last uh, you know um, thirty two months or two thirty two years or it's going to be twelve this or seven that or and you get you know six 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 these are all like numbers and so my my next book actually 
uh, I've got a book coming out in March that's just on this. I mean, it's on, um, it's called, uh, the book is going to be, the book is called Armageddon. <laughs> and Amazing. the, sub, the sub, sub, colon, subtitle is Armageddon, um, what the Bible really teaches about the end. Uh, and so, um, so I've been very much into the, you know, that kind of discussion about how people think that, um, you know, the end is coming soon. They predicted it. And so part of my book is showing that um, these people who have thought that, you know, the end, they, they're showing the signs are now being fulfilled. The end is coming soon. Um, my book shows why that's a misinterpretation of the book of Revelation. Uh, the author didn't have anything like that in mind. Uh, and that, um, and, uh, and not just Revelation, but Daniel and Ezekiel and these other passages that get used. But it, my book, my book's written for a general audience. And so it tries to, it takes on these people who have been saying this. And the interesting thing is, you know, people said this every generation since the first century that, oh yeah, now the prophecies are being fulfilled. It's, it's so obvious now. The and second coming is imminent. It's right around the corner. And the funny thing is you have some of these people who have now lived to be in their 80s and 90s who were, who were predicting when they were in their 20s that it's going to come sometime next year, you know, or it's going to come by the end of the 1980s. And what they do is they, they write a book, say, oh, it's going to happen by 1988. And then it doesn't happen in 1988. So they write another book. That's going to be 1989. <laughs> you know, then it's going to be 1994. And now and they go on TV saying, now it's being fulfilled. You, you said that 50 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> my calculations were just slightly off. That's it. It's fine. So like, part of my book is that. Part of the book is, a, you know, part of the book is actually a serious interpretation, trying to explain what Revelation is really all about. The book of Revelation. So what, um, what purpose did apocalyptic books like Daniel, like Revelation serve for the Jewish community? So... It's a very it's a very interesting um, topic about where this point of view came from. Um, when I was in graduate school, one of my first PhD seminars was uh, was a Hebrew Bible seminar called "From Prophecy to Apocalyptic," and the thesis of the seminar still stayed with me all of these years. I, I think it was absolutely right, um, which is that apocalypticism, as I've just briefly described it, emerged out of other ways of looking at God's relationship to the world in ancient Judaism. So when you when you when you read the Old Testament, there's a constant theme about why it is the people of God suffer. Um, you know, like poor poor little Israel, you know, first they get first they get the northern kingdom gets destroyed by your Assyrians. <laughs> and then a, a century and a half later, the Babylonians come in and wipe out the southern kingdom. And so, you know, and, and then you, you know, like one kingdom after the other. And then you get the Persians. Then you get the Greeks. And then you get the Syrians. And then you get, it's like this little, and it's because where Israel is, of course. I mean, if you want to control, the, you know, what you, you know, the Mediterranean, you know, yeah. the fertile crescent, you've got to get Egypt. But to get to Egypt, you know, you, you got to go down the fertile crescent through Israel. And so it's the only way you can do it. And so so Israel's keeping being destroyed by all these these nations in the Bible. Um, there is a in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, there's a consistent, a consistent message about why this is happening to us. Why, if we are the people of God and God has given us this land, why are we continually being thrown overthrown? And we have military defeat, we have economic disaster, we have, you know, and we have famines and we have droughts. And we thought God was on our side. What's this all about? And the consistent message throughout the, uh, throughout the Hebrew prophets and throughout mo most of the Hebrew Bible is, you, the people of God, have sinned and God is punishing you. You need to repent because if you don't, he's going to wipe you out. Then they get wiped out and say, see, I told you you were going to get wiped out. And it's because you sinned that God's punishing you. So that was the standard view uh, throughout the Hebrew Bible. And apocalypticism is a view that arose in response to that. After hundreds of years of Israel thinkers saying this is God's punishment, finally there came a situation where they just couldn't say it anymore. So about 200 years before Jesus' public ministry, there was a... There was a situation in Israel where the there was a, the Syrians, not the Assyrians, but the Syrians were in charge of Israel, and there was a particularly bad Syrian, bad for Israel's point of view, bad Syrian king named Antiochus IV, sometimes called Antiochus Epiphanes, and he legislated that Jews in Israel 
could not keep the Jewish law. They were not allowed to. If they, if they um, circumcised their babies, babies would be killed and so would the mothers. Uh, if they if they tried to keep if they tried to keep the Jewish laws, you know, whatever, pick your law. Um, so the, this monarch is trying to force them to eat pork and trying to not allowing them to circumcise it and uh, on pain of death. At this point, Jewish thinkers are saying, look, we're not being punished because we're sinning against God. We're trying to do what God said. He said, circumcise we're your being baby punished boys, anyway. keep kosher. And we're still so it can't be God doing this. And they came up with the idea that there's an opponent of God, a supernatural power opposed to God, who's doing this. And that's that's when they come up with the idea of the devil as a supernatural power opposed to God. And that's when they come up with the idea of there being demons in the world. So you have God and his angels and you have the devil and his demons. And you get and and the forces of evil are fighting the forces of good. But uh, but since God is ultimately sovereign in the Jewish tradition. Ultimately, he's in control. He's going to destroy them. And so this, this is the view that, that came to be going to destroy the forces of evil. And so that this is the view that then became, uh, that scholars today call apocalypticism. And you first find it in the last book of the Hebrew Bible to be written, the book of Daniel. Uh, and then it, then it becomes prominent throughout Judaism. So the, the, the books then are explaining how <clears throat> excuse me, are explaining how there is this giant cosmic battle, but ultimately just hold on everyone because God will win and we will be okay and paradise will reign. Yeah, that's it. I mean, in some ways, these books like Daniel and then, you know, book the, the New Testament books are being written to tell people, look, it's going to happen soon. So just keep the faith, be faithful. If you're not, you know, if you're living a life of sin now, turn back because it's going to end soon and God's mm -hmm. going to bring in a good kingdom. Here, here on earth. Um, I should say something about the book of Daniel, I suppose, because people will be saying, yeah, but wasn't that written like in the sixth century BCE? Isn't that like 500 years before? You, and, the dating of Daniel is much discussion. Many well, words have been typed. Many words, and yeah, a lot of ink spilled on this one, but, but it's really, among critical scholars today, they're really, um, that debate is pretty well solved now that the book of Daniel was not written in the sixth century uh, during the Babylonian exile, so 500 years before Jesus, 600 years before Jesus, but it was written in the second century uh, BCE at the time that I'm talking about the rise of apocalypticism with Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, indications in uh, the book of Daniel that it was written at this period. It claims to be written by a guy named Daniel, living in the sixth century BCE, but it's, it's one of these ploys you find in these apocalyptic texts. We have a lot of texts that claim this kind of vision where a, a prophet sees the future and he sees that the end is almost, is almost here. And in almost every case, these, these Jewish apocalyptic texts are almost always pseudonymous, meaning they claim to be written by somebody who didn't write them. And so, like, we have an apocalypse written by Moses, you know, apocalypse by Abraham, the father of the Jews. We have an apocalypse by Adam. I was <laughs> going to say, Adam, and Eve. By Adam I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, so the Daniel and the others are they're they're written pseudonymous. Well, it's it's great because if you if you claim to be writing several centuries earlier than you actually are, all of your predictions are definitely accurate. That's right. So that's what happens with Daniel. Daniel predicts. This is going to happen. This so he, he has this vision in chapter seven, where Daniel, allegedly living in you know the five eighties or something BCE, sees that there's going to be this series of kingdoms that come up. There'll be four kingdoms that are represented by four dread beasts, one after the other, and. These four beasts come up out of the sea and they wreak havoc on the earth and they're terrible and horrible and they persecute the people of God. But then after the fourth beast comes up and various kings from the fourth beast, then one like a son of man comes on the cloud of heaven, clouds of heaven and the beasts are taken out of power. The last one is destroyed and the one like a son of man is made the ruler of the earth. So um, the, there's an angel standing by in these apocalyptic texts. 
whenever you have like a, a vision, you think, wow, that's weird. Uh, uh, and the, the prophet, all uh, Daniel sees this thing and he faints because he's, oh my God, this is too many. Like, what? what? And, but then the angel, there is an angel I stand by to explain what it is. And the angel explains, well, these four beasts that you saw coming out of the sea wreaking have these are four kingdoms. This will follow this, will follow this. And, this. and it's easy, it's easy to see what he's saying. The Babylonians, uh, they're going to be uh, they're going to be taken out by the Medes. The Medes are going to be taken out by the Persians. The Persians will be taken out by the Greeks, and as the Greeks you have these rulers and the like. So he's predicting all of these things, and the reader's thinking, "Wow, he got all that right. How do you know? He must be right about the rest of the stuff. He must have been right about the rest of the stuff." And so what he does is he predicts things up to his own day. He's not predicting because he knows what's happened, and he predicts. It sounds like he's, but then he keeps predicting. And when and when he gets closer to his day, like the predictions from a lot from centuries ago are kind of vague in general, but they get closer to his day, they get really Super specific. suspiciously specific. And, oh my god! And but then he keep and you're reading this thing. Oh my god, that just happened two years ago! And oh my, and you know, and then you get all excited, and then he goes on predicting what's going to happen next. And what what, what Daniel predicts, he didn't use the term Antiochus Epiphanes, but he, he he predicts that the guy who's causing the problems now is going to be wiped out, and destroyed, <laughs> and so. You think that's definitely going to happen because you've seen everything else happen, and so that's one of the ways that the that's one of the ways some of these apocalyptic thinkers did it was predicting that the horrible situation going on now is caused by these forces of evil in the world that are opposed to God, but we're at the very end, and soon God's going to intervene. He's going to destroy them, and He's going to give us the kingdom, those of us who are faithful to God. Now, that's an excellent lead on to my um, my next question. Do we know whether the people reading these and listening to them being recounted actually believed that they were, for want of a better word, true? Or was it more of a, a comforting story to make yourself feel better in a time of persecution? This is a question a lot of scholars have asked. And you know, ultimately, it's very hard to know because we don't have any uh, any uh, book reviews from the time. No, no readers reports <laughs> that actually tell us. What we do know is that when people do start talking about these books, they they think that they're serious and that they're that they are literally true, uh, and that they are predictions of the future. Um, you find that in early Christian circles, for example. Um, in in the at the end of the second century, beginning of the third century, there's a church father named Tertullian, a very prominent uh, theologian and a very important writer whose writings we still have today. Uh, Tertullian uh, talks about one of the apocalypses um, that is uh, that was connected with um, with Enoch, and and he says Enoch, you know the the. Enoch is this figure in Genesis who's taken up to God uh, without dying, and we have an we have a couple of apocalypses written by him, allegedly written by him. And Tertullian is writing about one of these things, and Tertullian Tertullian asks a kind of sensible question: that is, so if Enoch was living before Noah, and uh, Enoch wrote this book, he says, then how how did it survive the flood? Wouldn't it have been destroyed when the world was flooded? It was written on clay tablets and then fired. <laughs> Good guess. Well, that's not what found. he said. That's not <laughs> what he said. He said what happened is Enoch was Noah's ancestor. And, and so Noah memorized the text. And then after the flood, he wrote it down. <laughs> that's reasonable and so the, too. And so he believes it's actually written by Enoch. And he believes that it's a natural thing that's predicting. And he... So some of these books, you know, some of these books were taken so seriously and so literally that they were they were accepted as authoritative texts. Um, Daniel's the only one that makes it into the Old Testament, but we have a number of these in early Christianity as well that are predicting the ends coming soon or making these various kinds of predictions. And they were often taken quite seriously as literal declarations of what was going to happen. It, it's certainly, my husband does a lot of anti-apologetics work for the Old Testament. Um, and one of the things he's looked at a lot is prophecy, specifically the prophecy of Ezekiel um, against uh, Tyre. So he says that the city of Tyre will fall and the city of Tyre did not fall, demonstrably, archeologically speaking, did not fall. And Ezekiel later on in the book essentially says, oh, I was wrong. Um, but interestingly, you get modern apologists 
explaining how Ezekiel wasn't actually wrong. It's just that he wasn't talking about the island city of Tyre. He was talking about the mainland, which was, by the way, a completely separate city with a separate name called Ushu, not Tyre, not what Ezekiel was talking about. But you have people kind of retrofitting this prophecy to make it true. Yeah. Is it, do you get, do you get similar things with oh, apocalypses? Well, with apocalypses and with the teachings of Jesus and the teachings of Paul, I mean, for New Testament, this is like this is the big deal. Is that when when you read? So we're going to be talking a lot about this in the podcast, and so I've got to kind of condense it. But when you read in the Gospels, it's not that everything in the Gospels on Jesus' lips is something that he he actually said. The Gospels are written 40, 50, 60 years later, and they report a number of things that Jesus did say. But they also report some things that he probably didn't say and there's you know debates about which is which but some of the things it's pretty clear jesus said what were about how the kingdom of god which is this utopian kingdom god's going to bring to earth it's not it's not it's not what's going to happen to your soul when you die it's not that you're going to die and your soul goes to heaven that's not what he means by the kingdom of god jesus is talking about a kingdom <laughs> you got a kingdom of rome you're going to have a kingdom of god and um, jesus predicts it's going to happen it's going to come. The destruction of the forces of evil and the coming of God's kingdom is going to come before his disciples all die. Or as he says in one, in, according to Mark chapter 9, verse 1, which is something I think Jesus really said. And he's also said, as in Mark 30, 13, that, that this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. After he's described the destruction of the cosmos. Uh, and so... Um, Jesus, I think, did think that the end was coming within his generation. But like like the destruction of Tyre, it didn't happen. And so people have to then explain, well, why didn't it happen? And you get a lot of that in early early Christianity already, because 40, 50, 60 years later, it hadn't happened. And they start saying things like, well, it didn't really mean like that. He meant that your soul right now. Oh, yeah. Or, or, you know, with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. So when he says it's soon, you know, if it's three days, it doesn't mean it's literally. And to, when people, people today quote that to me, you know, and they say, yeah, well, when he said soon, he doesn't, you know, a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. I say, okay, great. I said, so that means if Jesus, you know, if I'm telling you, Jesus is coming in three days, we can start looking for him in the year 5022. <laughs> So, I mean, it doesn't make any sense to say it's soon when you mean 3,000 years. <laughs> yeah. So we, we've kind of mentioned that um, one of the hallmarks of apocalyptic literature is this kind of very symbolic, um, kind of weird, trippy language and description. Do you think the, um, the supernatural nature of it and the symbolic nature of it makes it easier to go back and do that kind of retrofitting re-explanation you can say oh well it's it's a three-headed monster it's not actually supposed to be this kingdom it's supposed to be this other kingdom and and that kind of thing rather than with something like ezekiel which is i would say quite to the point and historically descriptive yeah that part of ezekiel certainly is and other parts are weird right the the vision that's true has, that's true the wheels within wheels thing wheels is within wheels bizarre. oh my god yeah so and the later apocalypticists, you know, were more interested in those kind of weird visions that you get in Ezekiel and the weird visions you get in Daniel for just the reason you're saying that if you've got a high, highly symbolic language uh, and if the language doesn't give you an explicit key for interpreting it, then, uh, you know, people can do anything they want with it and do and always have. What's interesting with the 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 book most people would be familiar with they most people haven't read it but the book of revelation is the one people think of as being this heavenly symbolic thing that gets interpreted in a million ways it's quite clear it's quite easy to show that virtually every way that people predicting the showing that revelation is predicting our future or it's going to happen in the near future it's it's very easy to show they've all been wrong because they have been, they, whenever, <laughs> when, 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 you, when you say it's going to be in 1844 and it doesn't happen, you know, then you say it's going to be in 1918 and it doesn't happen. Then you say it's going to be in 1988 and it doesn't, you know, like every time you got to, yeah. you got thousands of books. But the thing about the book of Revelation is, even though the, and this is true, Daniel too, um, the author does give very clear clues what he's talking about. 
and hints. And you've got to read it carefully to understand that. And people don't do that. They jump over the clues of what the author tells you he's talking about to, in order to expand whatever they want it to say. And so both Daniel and Revelation actually do give keys to their own interpretation, but you have to look carefully at them and people just don't do that. That's a good, a good lead into my next question, actually. You said, and I agree that I think that the most famous apocalypse is the book of Revelation. Um, even if people don't really know what an apocalypse is in terms of ancient literature, they've heard of it. Um, and are probably familiar with some of the imagery of the book. And then Daniel is probably the oldest apocalypse we have. And that was what, around 160 BCE yeah. revelation was the end of the first century. So that's, let's say 300 years in between the two. Yeah. Do we see, so obviously it's a very long lived literary tradition. Do we see changes or developments within the tradition between those two books or is it relatively consistent? Uh, that's a great question, and it's 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 a complicated question because um, the the author of Revelation, who calls himself John, um, and I think it was somebody named John. He doesn't claim to be the disciple John, John the son of Zebedee. In fact, he gives he gives indications in the book. He's definitely not, he's not he's some other guy named John. John is a very common name. This author uh, used the Book of Daniel. Uh, he he knew it and he utilized its imagery for his own imagery. And so, for example, you know, Daniel will have a, uh, a beast coming out of the sea with, uh, you know, seven heads and 10 horns or something. And Revelation will have a beast coming up out of the sea with seven heads and 10 horns. And it's, you know, so he's, he's reusing a lot of the imagery. Um, and so there are a lot of consistencies in basic worldview. Uh, consistencies are things like, these authors see the world in two forms. They're, they're dualistic. Like you, you, you've got two powers in the world. You've got the forces of good and the forces of evil, and they're fighting it out. So that's distinctive of apocalyptic. You didn't, you don't get that through most of the Old Testament. But these two. So you have God, and you have the devil. You got the angels. You got the demons. You got these various powers fighting it out. You also have the idea that um, the. Uh, the, the side that's winning now is the bad side. <laughs> Always the bad side. It's the and bad you see guys that are... as well in modern retellings of the apocalyptic. Oh, oh, yeah, I know. It's, I mean, everything's going to hell, literally. This is like yeah. Satan is taking yeah. over, which means the end is near. Yeah, no, that's right. And it's crept into popular culture, too. I mean, just watch Star Wars. I mean, it's like the back, you know, and so, so there are, so it's all sorts of, so you get the bad guys winning out, but ultimately, God's going to triumph because God is God is sovereign and he's going to he's going to win decisively and destroy the others. Uh, and when that happens, people who have sided uh, with the other will be destroyed. But those who have sided with God will be rewarded and be given an eternal kingdom. So this is you know, utopia, be a utopia. And the other thing they have in common, so I guess those are three things. The, the dualism, two things, the kind of pessimism, the things are not going well, uh, not going to for a while. The third would be the kind of the triumph uh, of God. And the fourth is imminence. It's going to happen right away. It's going to happen soon. Antiochus Epiphanes is going to be destroyed by God or the Roman Empire is going to be destroyed by God. That's, that's the teaching of Revelation, uh, that the Rome and its emperor are going to be wiped out and Christians will be given the rule of the earth, not the Romans. Um, and so those are consistent, but there are other things that definitely develop. The book of Revelation is all about Christ. Um, Daniel does not have a vision of um, Jesus as the Messiah directing it. And Revelation is all about um, Christ, who was the, who came the first time for Revelation and was destroyed by his enemies. And now he's coming back in revenge. Um, terms like vengeance, revenge are very big terms. The wrath of the Lamb of God, very big term in the book of Revelation. Blood, <laughs> very big term. <laughs> Interestingly, in the book of Revelation, there's no word about God loving anybody. And there's no word about hope. And there's no word about mercy. It's all about vengeance. <laughs> I deal with that in my book too. <laughs> Whoa, yeah. this is, uh, you know, people don't notice things like this, but yeah. So, so the basic motifs are very similar, but now I guess Revelation is 
is is like Daniel, but in a Christian mode, emphasizing mm -hmm. the the importance of Jesus. Thank you. Um, and there are, I believe, please correct me if I'm wrong. There are two main categories when you're looking at apocalyptic literature. There are two main categories. There's the heavenly journeys, in which a prophet is kind of taken up and given like a personal guided tour by an angel, like a going around a museum, except it's heaven. And then historical sketches, which I think is what Daniel and um, Revelation are, where with the mystical visions and, and symbolism. Do the two categories have different purposes or is it the same purpose, just different ways of fulfilling that? Yeah, no, that's another really good question, and it's a, a, another difficult one. You know, at this point, you and I are talking about apocalypsis, which is um, we're talking about literary works. We're talking about books that embody an apocalyptic point of view. Daniel uh, being the first one in the Bible, Revelation being the last book of the New Testament, and we have these others I mentioned, the apocalypse of Adam and Abraham and the apocalypse of Peter. We have these other ones. Um, these kinds of these kinds of books are not the only uh, forms of apocalyptic thought. In other words, um, today you can be a capitalist without writing a book on economics. Right? If you have a capitalist writing a book on economics, that's a capitalist book, and so you, you get. To, but so with apocalypse, you had a lot of people who were apocalyptic. Like Jesus was an apocalypticist, but he didn't write an apocalypse. So we're talking about the apocalypse now, and you're absolutely right. They they tend to come in two forms. Sometimes. A, uh, a visionary, the, the prophet, will be taken up to heaven and will see kind of the heavenly realm. And by seeing what's happening up in heaven, that shows why what's happening on earth is happening on earth. It's because the heaven is, the earth is kind of a reflection of what's going on up above. And now you see the ultimate reality that explains this mess that you just can't understand when you're looking around down here. And so that's one kind of, it's a heavenly journey. The other is a kind of um, historical prediction where you see these symbolic visions of this will happen, then that, then that, then that. And so a symbolic, and so there's more like a historical sketch. So a heavenly vision and a historical sketch. Um, and Daniel does tend to be more like the historical sketch kind of thing. This, 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 and this. Um, this beast and this, this, and this beast. Revelation, interestingly, is kind of both. <laughs> uh, Revelation is is unusual among apocalypses for a number of reasons, but one is that it has both the heavenly vision. In, in chapter four of Revelation, the author gets taken up to heaven and everything he sees is up there in heaven, uh, but it's describing the sequence of things that are gonna happen here on earth. And so it, it takes the two and puts them together. So these are not inflexible categories. Uh, just some apocalypses are one, some are the other, and some have some of both. Yeah. I'm not sure about historical sketches, but the the heavenly vision does have, and I, I'm not saying that they're related, but there are similar modes of thought in Mesopotamia. There's a um, a giant carved stele called the Stele of the Vultures that shows on one side uh, an historical conflict between two cities like men and, and kings battling. And the other side is the the divine equivalent. So, and it's the the two city gods yeah. fighting each other and and yeah. which god yeah. is is victorious has a direct impact on, on which, uh, which army is victorious. So it, it's the same kind of reflection as what happens in the divine realm is, is directly translated into what yes. happens for mortals as well. Yeah, and you know, a lot of people have, uh, I, I, I don't know about you know, other influences uh, on Judaism, but a lot of people have thought that, per the, that Persia is mediating a lot of this stuff into, uh, into Israel. Uh, Persia, in, per in Persian religion, you get Zoroastrianism, which is also mm -hmm. another dualistic way of doing it. And the question is, you know, the Persians had conquered Israel for a while, and so is it possible that Zoroastrian thought is affecting this? And so, when somebody's talking about something like apocalypticism, they're not necessarily saying, you know, this is the only thing ever like it, you know, in, in the universe. Because in fact, you get a lot of these dualistic systems uh, and they're interesting because of their distinctiveness as well as their similarities. And so that's what historians do, of course, they try to figure out, okay, what's similar? You know, could there mm -hmm. have been influence? And what's different that makes them unique? And the thing with the apocalyptic system that's different from Persia or ancient Near Eastern or whatever is that there's really only one ultimate God. Um, yeah, they're sticking with the Old Testament. There's one God, and uh, the other things are not as powerful 
as he is, and eventually he's going to try it. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Um, I've enjoyed talking about this very much, and I could actually keep going for a long time, but we shouldn't do that because I think we should also do an episode on Jesus as an apocalyptic prophet, mm. which I know you've written about, and uh, I think the audience would be very interested in hearing about. So we will save that for another time. Maybe several other times. That's another big one. Maybe, maybe several other times. <laughs> a lot. All of these topics, you know, the thing we're doing on the podcast now, just so in case people didn't hear this earlier, we're covering kind of big topics now that we will be, you know, we're just kind of laying out groundwork for lots of things we can be doing in the future, you know, and so we could have several uh, easily on Revelation or the book of Daniel or prophecy to, I mean, like all of these things. And, uh, and so, um, yeah, uh, Jesus is an apocalyptic prophet is a huge thing in uh, New Testament scholarship. And so we'll definitely want to be dealing with we are going to take a brief break. We will be back with Bart's weekly update and a Q&A session where Bart will answer listener questions. So please stick with us. If you're enjoying the Misquoting Jesus podcast, you'd probably like my online courses as well. I've produced a number so far with multi-lecture courses on the New Testament Gospels and the books of the Pentateuch, standalone lectures on the Christmas story, and the earliest Christian views of Jesus, and a six-hour debate on whether Jesus was actually raised from the dead. If you're interested, check them out at bartherman.com. You'll receive a discount on your purchase simply by entering the code MJPODCAST. Are you interested in learning about important academic topics but don't want to go back to school? You need to check out Wondrium, the service that streams university-level courses taught by top scholars who are also skilled communicators. I've done nine courses for them and can tell you, for high-level adult learning, there's really no other game in town. For a free trial, go to barterman.com slash Wondrium. If you decide to subscribe to Wondrium, this podcast will receive a referral fee but that'll have no effect on the cost of your subscription and you'll be supporting our show. And welcome back everybody. It's time for Bart's weekly update. This is Bart's weekly update, where we get to catch up on all the latest about Dr. Ehrman's book releases, speaking engagements, ehrmanblog.org happenings and online course launches. Bart, what do you have for us this week? Yeah, you know, I mentioned last time that I was, um, I've been reading all this uh, Greek and Roman ethics things. And I, there, there's this, uh, this author that most people don't know about named Diogenes Laertius. <laughs> he's a, he's our, he, he wrote a book that, that did small biographies of all the famous philosophers up to his day. He lived about 200 in the common era. And so, you know, it goes way back, you know, Plato and Aristotle and all these things. So I've been, been reading about the Stoics and there's a, the founder of the Stoics is this really interesting figure named Zeno. And so I've gotten interested in Zeno because Zeno, Zeno uh, maintained that people shouldn't, they shouldn't have many possessions and they shouldn't, they shouldn't care what they eat and they shouldn't care if they have any housing or they, you know, they, they just, those aren't the things that really matter. And it's interesting because these, that's similar in some ways to what Jesus thought, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that don't, you know, don't worry about what you eat, don't worry about what you wear, you know, these are not the important things. And so one interesting question scholars have had for a long time is the relationship between the teachings of Jesus and things like teaching Stoicism and, and the Cynic uh, philosophers and things. And so that's, yeah, so that's, that's the kind of thing, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing in my spare time, thinking about stuff like that. <laughs> that sounds interesting. I really yes. enjoy thinking about those kinds of connections and, um, working out is it an actual cultural transmission or is it yeah. just a similar idea being being thought about by someone else exactly right because obviously you also have people in the uh in, you know you have buddhists and you have people in completely other cultures and people tend to think well so there must be influence right is it like the silk road or something and, and you know it's absolutely possible that that's right but it's also possible that just like with the apocalypticism we were talking about different people in different cultures come up with different ways of you know different ways of, that are very similar mm -hmm. so uh, yeah i think there's a lot to be said as well for the fact that humans in general 
have similar experiences just by virtue of being human regardless yeah. of what culture you're living in so there are going to be similar thoughts that yes. are kind of prompted well, by those experiences that's exactly right and we are hardwired in very similar ways wherever we live i mean because of evolution i mean the reality is our species has survived because of the hard wiring uh, Certain, certain primates had ways of surviving and they, they, we're their descendants because the others didn't. Mm -hmm. And so we, our brains do work in similar ways, not identical, obviously, but, but so it's not surprising you'd have people in different cultures. Uh, yeah, different experiences, same, but they're very similar. And so similar ways of figuring it all out. I think we are going to go to audience questions now. Now it's time for Questions from Listeners, where Bart answers real questions submitted by Misquoting Jesus fans. If you'd like to submit a question for future segments, please visit bartermancom slash askbart. It's been a couple of weeks since we've done some questions, Bart. Are you ready? Yeah, well, you know, last time we did a uh, stunt bark, and so I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad these are these aren't like meant to stunt me, although many of them probably. No, are. <laughs> no, these, are, these are just people wanting your opinion on things. Okay, opinions I can do. <laughs> um, so, why did Christianity follow a more supernatural or mystical path, but rabbinical Judaism did not? Uh, well, that's a that boy. Yeah, that's that's a, we need a whole episode on that. We one. started with a big one. But, you know, it actually relates to the apocalypticism we were talking about uh, during the episode. Uh, in, in Christianity acquired the, uh, the apocalyptic ideas from Judaism. Um, and Christianity stuck with basic apocalyptic categories. Uh, and so Christianity was apocalyptic through Jesus, through Paul, and through, and so we still have the devil, and we still have demons, and we still have the dualism, we have it, and, and expectations that the end's coming soon. These are, but these are, these are rooted in a kind of a, of a mystical vision. Uh, and rabbinic Judaism rejected uh, apocalypticism, even though it started out as a, uh, uh, e even though, the rough lineage is that rabbinic Judaism emerges out of Pharisaic Judaism, which is something we'll be talking about on the podcast, obviously. But Pharisees were apocalypticists who believed in the coming end with the resurrection of the mm -hmm. dead and everything. And rabbis, rabbis traced their lineage back to the Pharisees. What ended up happening is when the Jewish wars occurred in the war in the year 70, where Jerusalem was destroyed, the temple was wiped out, burned. And then in the year 135, another uprising. The rabbinic, the rabbinic uh, teachers ended up insisting that this apocalyptic view uh, of that, you know, that God's soon going to intervene and destroy things just is not the right way to look at the, at the religion. And they developed a whole different religion that was anti-apocalyptic. Uh, and so that happened within Judaism, but it didn't happen within Christianity. And I think that's why, of course, you still have Jewish mysticism through the ages. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you get, I mean, you know, you get you get all sorts of <laughs> uh, Kabbalah and you know and all sorts of but but the the standard tradition is anti anti Jewish and not particularly mystical. Um, why did apocalyptic literature grow in the Second Temple period, and how were they understood by contemporary Jews? So it grew in the Second Temple period because in uh, in the one sixties, as you were saying, there was this uprising against Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, and uh, it happens in the 160s, and there's a, a thing called the Maccabean Revolt. The Maccabean Revolt is called that because it's led by a, a family uh, of, uh, they end up being guerrilla soldiers uh, who were uh, sometimes called the Maccabees. Um, and they, uh, they were opposed to foreign uh, oppression of Israel. They established Israel as a sovereign state uh, in 142 BCE, it lasted for about 100 years. Israel, again, was a sovereign state, which it hadn't been for hundreds of years. And, and it stayed that way until the Roman general Pompey came in uh, in year 40 BCE and, and took over. But so during this period, you have, you have Jews who have adopted this idea that the reason things are going badly is because of these forces of evil. And so this, uh, this, this became a very popular point of view 
that makes sense within Judaism especially. It makes sense in a lot of cultures, but in Judaism, it, there still was this view that God had given us the promised land. And this is our land. God promised us to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so we have it. And you still have these foreign powers. You got rid of the Syrians, and now these Romans are in. And so apocalyptic Judaism, apocalypticism becomes a, a, a prominent thing then because of that. And uh, it absolutely was taken literally. This is a point of view that was widespread throughout Judaism. Uh, it was a point of view among the people who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. Is view held by the Pharisees, is held by lots of independent groups, is held by John the Baptist, is held by Jesus. I mean, just kind of go on. And the people we know about, a lot of people held these, this view, and they did take it very literally. Um, and finally, is the book of Revelation's condemnation of Jezebel representative of a shifting attitude towards women? Uh, this is a very troubling passage in the book of Revelation. Uh, the uh, for those who, who aren't familiar with it, there's a um, you won't be familiar with it because this is not the part of Revelation we prefer to talk about. Uh, John, the the uh, John who's writing the book of Revelation, is instructed by Christ to write seven letters to seven churches uh, in Asia Minor, and so he writes these letters. Christ dictates these letters, and one of the letters is written to a church in a city called Thyatira. In Thyatira. The uh, John, uh, from Jesus, through John, um, condemns a prophet in the church, a woman prophet named Jezebel. That's pro Jezebel is a symbolic name. Jezebel is a, uh, is a woman figure in the Old Testament in the days of Elijah, who was an evil queen uh, of Israel. Uh, and so this prophet in Thyatira is called Jezebel because she's an evil, evil person as well. And she's a prophet, which means that she's um, she she is one who God speaks through in the church, or at least claims to be. But John thinks that she is completely wrong because she is allowing people to eat meat that was offered to pagan idols in pagan worship ceremonies. And people people typically when they ate meat in the ancient world had to eat meat that had been sacrificed to gods because the priests in Greek the priests. Yeah. It's expensive, but also the priests were the butchers. <laughs> you didn't have butchers, you had priests. They they kill the animals and then they butcher and they sell the meat. So so they're, basically she's approving of, you know, if you want some meat, yeah, it's okay to eat that meat. Who cares, you know? But uh and and she said and she was in support of gross sexual immorality, according to according to John, who's writing this letter. So John condemns Jezebel, this prophet, for saying these things, that you can eat the meat and engage in sexual license. And Christ tells Jezebel that he is going to throw her on the bed, on a bed. He's going to throw her on a bed, and men are going to come and have sex with her. And Jesus then will kill her children. Wow. Um, some people, some translations will say that he's going to throw her on a sick bed, meaning a hospital bed, but it's not the word. It's just the word for bed. And what happens is she doesn't go to hospital. She has sex with random men. And so it's not clear what to make of Christ's, what Christ is actually doing here. Uh, but it does say that he's going to kill her children that she has. And so you think, oh, my God. And so is it uh, so... It is not. It is not a very um, warming view of mm -hmm. Christ's relationship to women. Uh, one of the things I'm going to talk about in my book, uh, I'm going to go through the entire book of Revelation and talk about various images that are very troubling, admitting that they're images, they're symbols, they, it's imagery. But why this kind of imagery? I mean, why? Imagery where a woman's getting raped because Christ throws her on a bed and then he murders her children. I mean, why that kind of imagery? And so I'll be talking about the imagery. And one of the things I'll be talking about is does this author, the author of the book of Revelation, does he actually embrace the gospel of Jesus? Is this is this the kind of thing Jesus held to? Mm -hmm. Not just this instant, but I mean the whole vision of Revelation. Yeah. So it ends up being kind of an important for me, I think this ends up being a kind of important book that I, I've, I've written because it's it it's dealing with a central issue of 
how Christian, how and to what extent Christianity endorses the t actual teachings of Jesus, and how how it goes its own ways, and in sometimes not very helpful ways. It's it's an interesting question for today. I think has Christianity I, gone yeah. some other way? I absolutely think so, and especially again looking at apologists that we come across online, you get a lot of people saying, "Oh, that's not real Christianity," and they say it to each other. And about everyone who essentially doesn't agree with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think this this will be a very interesting book. I mean, it's it's a legitimate. I think the question itself is legitimate. Uh, mm. the, the way you answer it is the question. You know, if if what you're saying is, yeah, well, you know, if if you believe in X, Y, or Z, you can't be a Christian because I don't believe it. You know, that's one thing. But yeah. if you're just doing it historically, I'm just doing it historically. I'm not a Christian. I'm, not, I'm just doing oh, it yeah. historically. Is this what Jesus thought? You know, Jesus think, is this the kind of thing Jesus thought about women? <laughs> or like, is this kind of thing Jesus would use? And so historically, it's a question. And then people of faith also have the question about how to deal with it. Excellent. Well, thank you. I, I'm looking forward to that. I'm sure yeah. other people are too. Um, before we finish for the week, would you mind just giving um, maybe a brief summary of, of what we've talked about and uh, why it's important again? Yeah, so uh, we've been talking about apocalypticism, which is a Jewish worldview that developed a couple of hundred years before Jesus' ministry that maintained that the reason people suffer is because there are powers of evil in the world that are creating the suffering. So the devil's causing it or the demons are causing it or other forces are causing it. And in this apocalyptic view, God was going to triumph over these forces of evil and destroy everything that was evil and everyone who sided with them to bring in a good kingdom on earth. And this was originally a message of hope for those uh, who are suffering. It's a message that is not found throughout most of the Old Testament, just in one book, really, and parts of a few others. And But it's dominant in the New Testament. It's the view, worldview that affected Jesus, and it's a worldview of the very foundation of Christianity. And so it's a worldview that's very important to understand. Thank you very much. And audience, thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please remember to subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss future episodes. Remember also that you can use the code MJPODCAST for a discount on all of Bart's courses at www.bartehrman.com. Misquoting Jesus will be back next week, but what are we talking about next time? Next week we're talking about the truth. Hey, <laughs> and so so uh, a lot of a lot of people um, you know want to know is is the New Testament true? And a lot of people, I think a lot of people ask that don't mean the same thing by it. And so I want to I think we're going to talk about like what does he what would it even mean and what it, what issues are involved in talking about the truthfulness of the New Testament. Always a good question. What is truth? What is truth? We will see you all next week. Thank you so much and goodbye. This has been an episode of Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday. So please be sure to subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcast listening app or on Bart Ehrman's YouTube channel so you don't miss out. From Bart Ehrman and myself, Megan Lewis, Thank you for joining us.